get a sense of where people are. So, um, morning all, and thanks for joining. Um, uh, again, I think we're short because it's July, and <laughs> and then August will be even more more challenging. Um, although I think a few of the names, I'm kind of surprised with. Uh, um, anywho, let's 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 get going. So, Todd, uh, where are we with? Uh, and actually, I think that Brian and I, I think I like the, the 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 phrase that he's using. Instead of hackathon, call these things hack fests. Um, but uh, because they're not really contests, and I think hackathon is much more closely associated with contests. Um, where are we with uh, the July, August, and September? Yeah, so uh, things are looking good. We'll, we'll get that updated to, to Hackfest. For the San Francisco uh, Hackfest, it'll be July 26th and 27th. Uh, 40 people have registered so far, so really happy with the results there. Uh, we suspect some more will be joining, so if you haven't had a chance to register, please take care of that at your earliest convenience. Um, the next thing we're going to want to be thinking about as it's about two weeks out at this point is just some uh, general agenda planning. Um, I know we typically run these fairly in unconference format, but if there are specific topics or things that people want to rally around, um, let's definitely get some structure in place um, above and beyond uh, kind of a kickoff and wrap up and whatnot. Um, so I'll pause for a second now if there are topics people would like to see see get added or specific direction. Yeah, so um, actually Brian and uh, and I and Rai were on a, a thread earlier this morning. I don't know if Brian's on or not, but um, you know we are or we had been planning to transition the fabric over to Garrett um, and um, of course we're a little bit challenged because two of the maintainers have been out on vacation the past couple of weeks um, uh, but you know, maybe we could finish the planning for that and actually schedule the transition to happen. Maybe like right before the Hackfest, and then that way we could use that time to sort of iron out any, um, you know, any issues that we have, and also help people with the transition. You know, maybe if Rai could come down and um, and visit. Uh, Anyway, so that was that was one thought that I had, and then the other um, uh, that I was thinking about, and and sort of I think you know Sawtooth Lake I think had a really good idea of um, you know having people write uh, I guess in their case it was you know adding to the arcade of, uh, of um, transaction families and adding uh, the the battleship game, but you know we could think about you know being more focused on actually writing apps. I think the Fabric, certainly from the Fabric perspective, is in a really good shape now to actually start thinking about writing apps and starting to get feedback on, on that aspect of things. Um, and so maybe we could we could do some, some of that. It, it, I guess it really is going to depend on who's there and, and, and what they'd like to do. I don't know, maybe... Um, I don't, I don't know what others think, but you know maybe we should have some sort of a discussion here about what people would like to have or would like to see happen at the, the next hack, hack fest. Don't all start at once. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Hannah. Uh, actually, that was another thing, um, and I, I I meant to uh, to bring it up uh, on the on the agenda. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the marketing team is actually they want to do a um, a demo at Cybos, and uh, I I said, well, actually, it would be at least two because we have the fabric and we have sawtooth, um, but um, they would like to have somebody work with them uh, from a technical perspective in helping to keep them grounded in reality about what that demo might demonstrate and what it might seek to do. Um, and they were actually looking for somebody to come and 
help brainstorm with them next week, but that we would then use some of the Hackfest time with some subset of people to start working on developing demos for Sawtooth and for Fabric that would be official Hyperledger demos that could be used at not just Cybos, but going forward at other um, uh, other venues as well. So I'm actually looking for two um, technical people, one from, I don't know, Dan, if you've got somebody from your team, and then one from uh, from the fabric, which I have to, uh, I, I actually meant to circulate that internally, but uh, do we have any volunteers for that particular piece of work? And again, to be clear, this is really just a one-time thing. It just, I need somebody with enough technical depth on both sawtooth or on either sawtooth or the fabric that they could sit down with the marketing team in a one hour brainstorm next week to sort of hammer out what what a demo might look like and then we could then use that as a foundation for actually starting the development. Yeah, this is Dan. You can throw me onto that and I'll either attend or I'll find somebody on my team to attend. Okay, thanks Dan. Chris, this is Sheehan. I can uh, volunteer for the fabric, but I'll circulate it among the team and see if anyone else is interested. Great, thanks Sheehan. Okay. Um, Alright, so I'll, I'll give Greg um, Wallace, your your names. Uh, I'll, I'll send a note, and um, and if you have subs, then just let Greg know. And I think he's going to try and schedule a call uh, next week with um, the uh, the subset of the marketing team that's focusing on the Cybos demo. Um, okay, so we have the dates. Um, Todd, do do we need to? Uh, I think the the August virtual one. Uh, did we have any kind of closure on the the timing for that? Yeah. So uh, just tying up the July one really quick. I'll kick off a Google Doc into the minutes and dump these agenda topics into it, and we can just firm that up next week as well. Um, for August, uh, it's looking like the vast majority of people. Um, it works for the week of August twenty second, which would put it on a good cadence with what we're looking at doing the next couple months. Uh, so the one question is you know, for the virtual hack fest, two days or three days. Um, so I think, you know, doing Tuesday through Thursday or Wednesday through Friday, or maybe just truncating that to two, um, depending on what people want. Okay. Any, any preference there? Two. Okay. Others? All right, any objections to doing two? Nope. All right. Um, so then maybe we look at doing Wednesday, Thursday. That way we can get it kicked off and then start day two with the uh, TSC call when we know we know folks are around. Any, okay. any objections to that? All right. Here. All right, sounds good. Uh, and then lastly, um, the uh, European... Hackfest uh, in Amsterdam. A lot of people have filled out the doodle poll at this point. Thank you for that. Um, it's looking like most people are available the very first week in October. Um, the second would be at the end of the last week of September, right after as Cybos is right, wrapping up. Um, so we'll just circle back with uh, ABN Namro, who has graciously offered to host uh, and just confirm their exact availability, and we will get that. Uh, sent out to everyone uh, before the TSC call next week, so so people can make travel plans there. Okay, That's sounds that. good. Awesome. All right. Uh, next up uh, is exit criteria. Arno, I think I saw you on. Yes, I'm here. Great. Hello. So it's been a while, but uh, and so to be honest, there isn't like nothing drastic happened to the document. But uh, I think we should take some time to discuss where we are and what we want to do. Uh, in particular, so you know, overall on the document itself, uh, I want to thank those who made specific comments. I incorporated the fixes from Vpin and others to just try to make the document cleaner. I tried to incorporate some of the comments that we that were made 
before. But I think more importantly, what really need to be discussed is, I mean, last time actually Brian had been confused because the document is it contains several proposals or elements of proposals. And so there's the, the first two pages that you know are still there that I actually authored based on the input from everybody. And then past the second page, and I put a blank page to make it clearer that there's a there is a separation there. We had a we had a proposal from Jeremy, and uh, now we've received also a proposal from Bill, and Bill. You know, I think you're on, right? And I, I know you tried to reach out to me, and I apologize. I didn't get a chance to get back to you. I was out of pocket for several days, and uh, but I didn't mean to ignore you. <laughs> and so I, you know, in general, I, I'll be honest with you guys. Both of those proposals I find are very interest, uh, are have very interesting aspects. But I, you know, anyway, I'm impressed by the amount of work you put into this and the, the you know. The precision of some of the, the elements that you guys put in there, but at the same time, I don't know how to incorporate this with what I started, and and I wonder if it's not you know going too far and trying to be too 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 smart about this and you know over engineering it, and I don't mean that you know in a negative way. I'm just I just don't know how we use it in a way that still gives us enough flexibility that we don't you know corner ourselves basically so i i think we should try and take some time if it's possible here uh, to to discuss a little bit what what you guys are trying to do and how if possible we could leverage this into what we started with Well, this is Jeremy Severin. I thought from the discussion three weeks ago that we were going to get rid of. Um, um, I'm okay with getting rid of the whole table with the um, since the, I believe what we had uh, talked about was um, migrating some of that into the spec world. So I'm I'm happy to go and whack the table. Okay. Um, would you like me to do that, or? Um, well, no. If it's okay with you, I can do the editing. I just, I, I just don't, you know. When you, when you editor of a document like that, it's always a challenge, right? You don't want to look like you're just being impolite and just discarding absolutely for the input. And so I'm trying to be, you know, cautious here. I appreciate that. Not a problem. All right, and um, and and if there are specific elements in there that you think we could, uh, on the other end, incorporate in the text of both, please, you know, uh, feel free to make specific suggestions or even add the text. I, you know, I would very well, very much welcome this kind of input. And Bill, are you on? Can you tell us more about uh, what you sent in email? Because I know you sent it in an email, and I didn't see any follow-up, so. It didn't, you know, we haven't uh, had any chance to discuss it. I saw Bill on the list. I don't hear you. Are you on mute? It, it looked like Bill was on mute. I've just uh, unclicked the mute button next to him. Bill, if you want to try again. I, I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone for a moment. Bill, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? There you yeah. are. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I had a little audio issue there. Um, I think I think the idea behind it was, and I don't have the document in front of me right now, so I'm speaking from memory, but. Uh, I think the idea behind it was to have some sort of a simplified uh, matrix, if you will, for uh, people to consider uh, w when they introduce a project and then what in their minds it would take. Because I know that uh, Christopher Ferris had indicated that you know maybe the maintainers should be the ones that decide when it's mature and whatnot and not the, uh, the TSC. I don't necessarily disagree with that. It's not my position to do so. But that being said, I think there's some there's some uh, you know applications that may be submitted that are just not going to be as sophisticated and not intended to be as others. Mm -hmm. So the matrix would be a way of 
you know, differentiating those so that, uh, you know, we know what needs, uh, you know, a closer look when the time comes to, to, to call this thing, uh, you know, ready. And my question for that is, is uh, uh, we, we've only really discussed the graduation from uh, incubation to mature. And does the graduation from mature to deprecated, is that just something that's transparent to everyone? It just takes place automatically? Or is that another increment that, that, that the maintainers have to deem, hey, this is deprecated at this point? Um, well, my, my thinking on the deprecation part would be that the, the project maintainers would recommend that a project be deprecated and it would go through a period of um, dormancy but while it is still being um, sort of actively uh, supported there would be no new feature developments and so forth but certainly you know and and maybe we would need to think about you know do we only address you know critical vulnerabilities or are we also addressing you know um, you know, merging of bug fixes and so forth, but no new features. And then after some period, and again, I think we have to figure out what that period was, six months, a year, or whatever, um, the, the project could be put in the attic or, um, you know, completely archived. Right, um, right. Uh, where, again, I think it, it's, that's really, you know, deprecation is really a statement of we're not really um, intending to have this thing go forward. We'd like you to work on adopting some new thing or whatever, right? Um, and um, so, so my, my thinking was that that was really, you know, just like when is it ripe for a release, that that's really a function of the maintainers uh, putting that out. I think probably the TSC should get involved in the actual, um, uh, in, in the process just from an awareness and, and you know, so if a, if a team comes along and says we'd like to deprecate something, and others in the community think it's soon or whatever, um, or, or have some different ideas about that, then they can have that opportunity to have that discussion. But largely, it's really going to be a function of their feeling that they have the support of the community to keep something going forward. There's a static on the line, or is that just me? Uh, I hear it too. If you're uh, calling in from the phone, if you wouldn't mind just going on mute. Well, uh, let me let me just say real quick. I found a couple of mistakes in the document. I think I submitted to the mailing list. Jeremy has an updated. Uh, version and I guess uh, with our node and, and anyone else that if, if if you would like me to, to kind of do some more work and fill that out uh, because there's a few TBD things in the matrix I'd be happy to do that work I just wanted to get an initial response from people whether it was am I off base here or is this something that we could use uh, or, or is it not that's that's kind of what I was going for so uh, I, I would apologize as with our I was on vacation <laughs> selling my house uh, the the week that you submitted this, and it completely escaped my my memory that I needed to go back and and revisit it. So I I need to spend some quality time with your note, Bill, um, and uh, generally with this this whole thread. Um, Bill, this is Jeremy Severin. I took a quick look at it. Um, I th I think it might be a little complex, um, and I'd want to. Um, uh, talk th through with you maybe offline a little more um, because I had some uh, so I found a couple examples that uh, we might be able to use of uh, something for example that uh, IBM had on blue mix as well as a, f um, a US federal government FIPS standard um, that might provide some examples um, because there's so you have a lot of sophistication in there um, but it um, uh, it looked a little daunting um, at, fr uh, at sort of first pass. Yeah, I understand completely. Um, yeah, I can pass you my contact information over Slack, and then we can we can talk whenever you want to. But yeah, that, I mean that's good feedback. That's what I was looking for. 
I'm just trying to pitch in, and, and if you, you feel like what we have already is, is good enough, then, then that's good as well. But, yeah, if you, I mean, I'm completely open, but I do think that some way of people that don't really, you know, not everybody is going to be read on to every working group. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, sh it should be an easy way to look at it and say, oh, I see where that one is. I see what they're doing. I see what they're doing. Anyway, that's, that's what I was going for. Yeah. So I think uh, yeah. I, I don't I don't think there we have anything like that yet that I'm aware of. Um, so I, I I think it's I think it's still a gap. Um, so I don't I don't think it's it's that it's already taken care of. Um, I think there's a, there's a particular risk with all of this that because some of the fi the the financial side is complex and the crypto is complex um, that this isn't just a DevOps kind of thing. Or a you know standard rel distributed reliability kind of thing, but involves some functional expectations of the system. So I, I think it's a so, really important piece. I mean, I think at some point we have to get folks. You know, if this goes far enough, we have to get folks like NIST involved. Um, so I I think there's there's uh, and legal folks involved. Um, so I think there's a, there is potential for more to do there. So, so Jeremy, I definitely agree with that. I think that as a function of the software that we release being suitable for use in context A, B, C, or D, um, uh, that and again, I think, you know, depending on the domain, for instance, healthcare, we have certain criteria that need to be satisfied. Finance may have other potentially overlapping criteria that need to be satisfied and Internet of Things and, you know, on and on and on supply chain and so forth. Um, that, that it's likely that really what we're talking about is have we, you know, has the Hyperledger project um, you know, maybe in conjunction with the likes of NIST or, um, you know, uh, ha have we gone through and done the due diligence to be able to sort of assert that the software is suitable for um, uh, things, you know, kind of like going and getting FIPS 140 for a crypto um, uh, implementation, for instance, right? Um, that, you know, exactly. we see various levels of certification that can then be um, sort of used in, in, in an informed way by consumers or by vendors that are looking to incorporate the technology into an offering as to whether or not that's a suitable match and so forth. Um, I definitely agree that when we're talking about those aspects of the software that we release that um, that that those things pertain to the software itself and the again I think that the, the function of the incubation exit criteria was much more about um, as I think I've said in the past much more about the maturity of the team that's producing it right in other words do we have a diverse community of engineers you know representing multiple stakeholders so that the project is going to have some chance of sustaining itself beyond somebody sort of walking away from it, right? Um, you know, does the project team have a release process, or are they following a release process that we've established? You know, are they using the right, you know, nomenclature? Are they using the right tools, uh, you know, for tracking defects and responding to the community? All those, those things that are really necessary just for a functioning open source project team, if you will, and and not so much a function of is the software the right, you know, is it ripe yet, right, for various use cases. And I think, again, that the project teams should be the ones that decide and potentially, in, as, as you've noted, in conjunction with various certification bodies and or various other um, uh, works that we can do to try and, and, and instill some sort of confidence in the, in the quality of the, of the software that a particular release um, is suitable for a particular set of use cases. 
Um, I think that those two things need to be separate. And so I think you know the the work that you that you and Bill have done, I think, is very helpful in the the second part of that conversation about the the the, the maturity of the software, and and so maybe to to try and 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 help to um, uh, reduce the amount of confusion that we have. I, I think it's potentially the term mature is the thing that everybody's getting hung up on. Um, and we're talking about the maturity of a project team and maybe it's just a matter of you're in incubation until you are, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, we, I think we just need to maybe think of another term that we would use for a project that is not in incubation <laughs> and not and not archived <laughs> or not in deprecation. So I'm glad you're bringing that up. I don't know if Brian is on the call, but so that's the, the other part that we uh, that is kind of left open is last time Brian said that he pointed out that he didn't like the term mature for him. There was some kind of negative connotation as well. Maybe like you know it's not innovating anymore, which doesn't seem to to match what we want to convey. And uh, I mean. The Apache Software Foundation simply uses the term top-level project. And so I don't know that we want to use that term per se, but maybe something more along those lines, you know, there is, we could use. And so I, I'll, uh, I'll put the finger on Brian. He said he would, he would kick off a, a discussion on the naming, but uh, I didn't see that happen. I'll blame him for that. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if you all can hear me. Um, yes. Uh, yes. I, uh, okay, great. Um, I think either top level or active or stable would be the three that seem to make sense to us, um, or it would make sense to work use here. And I, I, I would say stable is great. Um, uh, active, uh, just behind it. Top level is a little vestigial from Apache. Uh, it has a, a meaning known in that community, but perhaps not more widely. So I think I'd be, I'd put my uh, marbles behind stable. What do people think of that? I kind of like active, but um, I could live with either one of those two. So, I mean, my, my first impression on stable is stable sounds like stabilized as in no further development. So it, it may create it may put the wrong connotation in some people's minds, um, unless that's what we want. <laughs> um, another suggestion, if only to reject it, is um, the, the thing that strikes me about all these projects is you know, this is a new frontier with you know, consensus critical code, which in some cases will be used for fiduciary purposes. Um, it, I think this is a point Chris is making, uh, co even code that we regard as good enough for some production use cases. Um, still won't be acceptable for other production level use cases until it's matured further and people have gained more confidence. Um, I suggest this only in case you want to reject it. Um, you know, Google with Gmail and some of their other apps were quite, you know, they're quite, quite overt about this. They had, you know, they, 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 they essentially just using the term beta once it was ready for people to use, but with no warranties and with an expectation there's more maturity to come. Uh, you know, a perpetual beta or a beta for five years has worked pretty well for them and it, and it gives the right signal. So just another suggestion. But again, that's the software as much as is the project out of incubation. And again, you know, the criteria that we're looking at, and if you look at the, the write-up that everybody's collaborated on here, it's primarily around the process of producing the software Less so on the software itself, right? Okay, okay, fair, yeah, fair point, fair point. So, so I think you know, and and no, but I I appreciate the the thought because I think that when we get to the to the nomenclature of releases, that your point is maybe quite relevant, and that maybe we do have a really long beta period until somebody comes along and certifies it for a particular use case, in which case we might call it GA for something, but, or, or uh, you know, we might just call it uh, uh, production or something. Uh, uh, but what, what do people think about, I mean, so, so Richard, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on using the term either stable or active for the project? Again, I think um, stable, of, of the, of the two, why sort of it's not, it, there's no, Further development, I, I guess, which is maybe unfortunate. 
Yeah, of the two, I prefer active. You know, because active. Okay, as well as being, sort of, it, 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 it's a positive and optimistic term. It also it, it, it signals things like you know, things are happening. So therefore, there must be a community. There must be some process. Um, you know, it, 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 it's not sitting there dormant, and therefore you know, there must be some maturity of the community. And given the confusion I had until you, until you reiterated it between um, the status of the of the process versus the status of the code. Um, yeah. Other people won't get that subtlety, so it has to. Um, um, so the, I, I, I think the risk is stable. Is stable. We'll just people will just believe it means dog. Other thoughts, Dan? Yeah, I agree with uh, Richard on that. Uh, I think stable is likely to be confused with stable versus develop and branches and, and things like that. Whereas active has that nice active connotation to it. Even if it's maybe subtly different than incubated, it still probably projects the right thing. Thanks. Uh, Hart? I'm just going down the list here. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, active is good. Uh, that's a good point about stable that people might think that new features and whatever aren't being added. Um, I'm, I'm completely fine with active if we want to go that way. Uh, Satoshi? In Nakamoto? Uh, who else we have here? Uh, Stan. I actually agree with uh, Richard's points that uh, I was initially uh, leaning towards stable, but the active makes a lot more uh, sense in terms of kind of indicating that it's an active community versus uh, just dormant, well, stable, working, but it's developing and growing. So my vote is an active. OK. Dustin. I'm auto leaning versus uh, both are OK. Stable and active would be the best for me. So stable in the sense of I can use it as a consumer and, and active people are still working on it. So I'm fine with it. Tomas? I like it. And who have I missed here? Um, Todd, who am I missing? Edget? Um, <clears throat> from what I've heard, I prefer active. Active? Thank you. OK. Um, it sounds like active, and and Brian, I think you're you're okay with that. Yep, sounds good. Okay, sounds good. And or no, why don't we go through and why don't we do two things here? Why don't we um, can we take the 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 table that Jeremy had started and the um, the proposal from Bill and consolidate that into another document that we can talk about maturity and and so forth of the software itself and 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 I don't know maybe one of you two might be interested in sort of you know leading that effort of pulling some of that together. I, I know that you two were going to sort of get together off, offline and and I think that that would be a valuable conversation to start. Um, and then and then Arno, can you sort of Take the plan and, and you know adjust according to you know using the term active, and, uh, and we'll bring that forward uh, next week. Yeah, and I will also if, if now we have an agreement and it's officially adopted, that will update the project lifecycle document so that I change the mature stage uh, and call it active in that document yeah. as well. Because we have several references in different documents, so I can kind of look around and update all the references to use the term active. Awesome. Thanks. OK. Um, where's my screen? <laughs> Sometimes I don't like. And again, I mean, uh, I, I saw several people, you know, added the various species. And I know Brian added some 
reference to the numbering of the releases and you know consistent release numbering is important and if there are other things like this or even grammatical you know uh, improvements please feel free to uh, to make suggestions I very much welcome that yeah I think it's really close on um, I think uh, um, uh, consolidating some of the other proposals after the first few pages into the into those first two pages would be would be ideal um, uh, but uh, I think I, I, I think it's really shaping up to be to be good it just needs to be uh, more tightly edited and I think we could probably converge on something for approval uh, at next week's meeting okay. so we're just chatting in the chat and I wonder and since you're going to go in there and do a little bit of on the life cycle. I wonder if we just just finish this last thought here. Um, Stan brought up the, the term dormant. I think you know we had gone from active to deprecated, and I wonder if we need a dormant stage in there where something is, you know, I mean, basically it's it's done. <laughs> I don't know if, if any open source is ever done, but sometimes they are. Um, and and maybe we want to have a phase where something is done and it's perfectly fine and and people are fixing it, but we're not, you know, um, we're not actively developing it, right? Well, maybe. the obvious name that would be inactive, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and maybe we have to think about that one because yeah. actually, dormant and inactive, and and you want to somehow rather you know say that it's being sustained, but not developed. Um, I think there's a difference. Anyway, we should maybe think about that. But let, let yeah, let, let's move forward with what we just decided, and and we'll take that up later. Um, uh, and then um, Todd, I think you had put together a draft of a timeline for the TSC elections. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and then we can skip back right after that to the taxonomy discussion. Uh, if that makes sense. Um, so let me just drop the link into the window. I, I did skip over that. Uh, do, you, do you want to knock this out quickly or move back to the... Uh, yeah, actually, this is Brian. I can make that a real quick thing. Um, I uh, had somehow missed the uh, semantic versioning specification out there. Um, I rather like that. I think uh, um, I was trying to re-implement it poorly. <laughs> so... Um, uh, why don't we take another week, uh, everyone, to take a look at stemvare.org, and maybe um, we talk about at the next uh, meeting adopting that uh, for Hyperledger projects. How does that sound? That works for me, Brian. Okay. Okay. Great. One, one last document for us to maintain. <laughs> um, uh, so, so Todd, the uh, the TSC. Yep. Uh, so that's uh, in the chat window now. We just pulled together a quick uh, overview. Um, so the initial startup period for six months for the TSC, it's comprised of the premier members. After that point, uh, it moves so that the TSC voting members will consist of 11 elected contributors or maintainers uh, that get chosen by the active contributors. So I just put verbiage from the charter at the top of this just as a reference point uh, and how the charter defines contributors and maintainers. From there, uh, we put together a timeline to get this taken care of during the August timeframe. So the first phase of that would be, we will send out an email to all of the uh, the contributors and maintainers at this point to call for nominations during uh, a one week period, at which point it would go into voting uh, in which the active contributors would all vote and rank their nomination, uh, rank their choices. Uh, and then from that, um, we will announce the 11 new TSC members. From there, we would kick off a second election, much like we did at the beginning of this TSC, um, in which we'll elect a chair from that new group of, of 11 TSC members. Uh, and then all of that will conclude on September 8th. Any feedback on the 
process itself. Okay. Um, uh, thing that's missing here is the criteria, and I think maybe just a little bit of clarification on um, what the, the sort of the, the premise we were going on in terms of contributors. Um, and basically, that would be anybody that's contributed um, to the technical um, aspect of the, the, the various projects. Um, and so that would be code. So we have, you know, we can obviously pull the list of people that have um, sent in a commit, um, documentation. Uh, so there's been some work on things like, um, you know, the requirements working group and the white paper working group. I think that would be considered documentation. Documentation, uh, so people that have contributed towards that, um, I, I would actually count. You know, the contributions to um, uh, some of the discussions we've been having here, for instance, on the exit criteria and and so forth. I think we have a little bit more work to do to figure out who contributed to those. Um, and then um, I was actually going to extend it to the people that are actually actively. Um, and, and meaningfully contributing and participating in some of the work groups, although I know we haven't yet produced anything, I think it's probably worthwhile to recognize that contribution. Um, and so, so that was the thinking that I was going on. I just want to make sure that people are comfortable with that going forward, at least for this time around. I think you know, as we go forward, we can maybe uh, it, it'll become a lot clearer because we'll have a lot more people in the community, but that that was what I was going to go on. And again, I, I don't get to choose. I mean, I think we have to collectively choose what the process is for ourselves. This is Brian. I'm, I'm very supportive of taking a very broad view of who a contributor is. Um, uh, I think it's anybody who's um, made you know, a, a, a an actual <laughs> uh, offered anything of, of intellectual value to the project since its inception. Um, uh, I think we have plenty of room over time to tighten that up if we need. But right now, we're still in a community building phase, and I'd love to see this be a, a big tent. So, mm -hmm. for us. so if what well, can we get a. Todd, can you just do a, a poll of the group to get everybody to sort of agree to that general characterization that I just made? And then yep. that way we have that up. Yep, no problem. So just taking a quick vote uh, in terms of the, the definitions as Chris describes them a little more broadly. Uh, if you're in support, just let me know. Uh, Stan from CME Group. Yes. Uh, Tamash. Yes. Stefan. Stefan, are you there? You might be on mute. Stefan? You just might type in the chat, too. Yeah. Uh, Hart? Yeah, that sounds good. All right. Oshima-san? Is that a yes? Yes, I agree. All right, thank you. Uh, Chris? Yes. Richard? Uh, yes, if I'm on it. All right, Ajit. All right, I see in the chat window. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I think that was just Stefan. If you can either type in the chat window uh, or or respond. Hey, <clears throat> on the membership, a, um, a quick question, Chris. This is Morali from DDCC. Is there a or Todd? Um, is there a limitation on how many TSC members from a particular organization, or there's no limitation from an organization perspective? That's a good question. I don't think we. That... Uh, yeah, this is Brian. I, I, you know, I don't know of a comparable rule in other open source communities um, that would limit it. Uh, I also feel like we, um, <clears throat> I'd love to see the project move to a role where we're recognizing participants as individuals rather than who they work for. And I think during this bootstrapping phase, we do to the degree that we want to guarantee diversity. 
but over time, you know, I think uh, the, a duocracy or a <laughs> meritocracy um, should really carry the day. And so, uh, I, I I would hesitate to implement a rule that prevented more than one person from a company um, from participating. I would leave it up to the contributors to make a fair assessment of. Um, you know who they feel. It's not really a, a, a competition over who has contributed the most. Um, I think it's it's uh, it should be a vote that reflects um, you know uh, people's opinion on who would make a good member of the TSC, and that might be somebody who doesn't contribute as much as you know 20 other people do, but but simply helps represent uh, diversity. So I think with that, I'm comfortable with the idea that we wouldn't have a um, limit. Uh, on number of number of TSC members per uh, per company. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have. Uh, I mean, unless Stefan comes in, um, I think we're. I think we're we're that that we're agreed on that 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 um, classification that I described. Um, and now I'm looking for my here it is. Um, so now we actually have a proposal to to review. Let's see what time we are at here. Still have plenty of time. Good. Um, so we have the uh, W3C workshop update. Oh yes, right. We have two things. So we have a proposal and we have the W3C workshop. I keep skipping over them. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and I don't know if Chris Allen is on. I didn't hear him. I, uh, but Arno, maybe you could give us a, yep. a brief recap of the uh, the W3C workshop. And if anybody else was uh, in attendance, they want to share their perspective, that would be most welcome. Yeah, I'll be happy to give a, a debriefing type of report, uh, and I will put in the chat room a link. To the report. It's not final yet. It's the first draft that the JCC has made available, and they're trying to. It always takes them weeks to get those reports together. And as they, in this case, they are trying to leverage the community to get everybody to chip in on developing the the report. I'm not sure it's working. For now, they haven't got any contribution, but hopefully it will work. But in any case, just beware. It's not final, but I'm happy to share it with you because if you look through it. You'll see that it already it already provides quite a bit of content, which I think is useful to get an idea of uh, what what happened. And so, you know, in summary, I would say that the um, the workshop was very well attended. There were like a hundred people. It was a big room with plenty of people, and so it was a great opportunity to have a bit of networking going on and talk about you know what the WCC might be able to do in that space. Um, the, 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 the workshop was organized with several sessions focusing on different topics. There was a, a first section of the agenda that was focusing on identity with several presentations. There were fairly short presentations, but it helped identify areas of, you know, problem areas that could be of interest. Uh, there was a session on provenance, and there was a much more broader uh, kind of uh, open session. And I used that one to put my hat in the ring as a representative of the project here to talk, present briefly what this project is about and uh, the position that was put together on, uh, you know, generally speaking, very shortly, is the idea that, you know, it might be too soon to stop standardizing anything in this space, but if the DRC or anybody were to develop standards, it should be done in a very modular approach where standards are developed in very focused and so that we could remain, you know, we could we could keep that capability of having a very modular architecture that, uh, and and we wouldn't be shackled by any standards that would be prematurely developed. And so I, you know, I can say I'm happy to say that it was great opportunity to expose the, the to present on the project and give it a bit more exposure. I did get quite a bit of uh, follow-ups with people coming to me and asking me more about the project. And you know, off the top of my head, I had several people come, and it's hard to remember who they were exactly now. But I remember, for, for instance, there was a gentleman from Huawei who was very interested and asked me, you know, there are people who are just like, can you tell me more about the project? We're just a bit confused. 
and some people, you know, the, have a hard time. And I, I should say, the audience was very diverse, right? Uh, there are people, you know, from vendors, like technology people, and there are also people from legal trying to figure out, so what does it mean from a legal point of view? What's the liability issue related to blockchain, for instance? And so you have consumer type of people, and you have people from finance, of course, but, you know, and a bunch of consultants trying to figure out what's going on. They want to not miss the boat, obviously. And so they, they, it's kind of a very rich audience. And I can say I have a lot of experience with the RTC workshop. From that point of view, it was much more diverse, I would say, than what we typically see where the problem is much more technical in nature and, you know, you kind of see the same people that you used to see all the time. And so that was kind of interesting from that point of view. But so, yeah, and, and so what I was saying is, you know, there are people just trying to figure out what blockchain is about and what the Hyperledger project is trying to do. And, um, and then there, there are people just like, you know, they, so the person from Huawei, for instance, who came to me, he was asking very specific questions about how to become a contributor. He really wants to join and start, you know, running code. And he actually already started looking from one night, to the, you know, from one day to the other. And he was asking me more questions the next day and stuff like that. So I, I think it was a great opportunity for us to, to, to expose the project and give it a little bit more, you know, presence out there. Um, otherwise, so at the end of the, the workshop, in typical workshop type of, uh, uh, you know, way, um, there was kind of a free-for-all. There were different tables put together to try and build a huge list of all the different possible activities that r 2 c could take on. And then, you know, um, everything was put on a big whiteboard and then people had like stickers to go vote and decide, you know, to express whether support for a specific activity, interest, uh, you know, if they were committed to participate and maybe lead the activity, or if they thought this was a danger area and the RTC should stay away from it. And so there was quite a bit of distilling exercise going on. And in the end, they came up with a list of things that seemed reasonable. It's, in my opinion, a very, very long list still. And so if you actually look at the draft report, there was this person who was quite amazing skills at, you know, graphically trying to capture what uh, is going on during the meeting. And um, you'll see that there is, a, there is actually one on uh, what the direct receipt might be able to do. It's the last one called commitments. And it's labeled under the RTC community and RTC standards. That's kind of a misnomer. What we're trying to, and I pointed that out and was acknowledged by the Dirt Easy staff, uh, what this is really about is they were trying to differentiate between, you know, activities that are more in the stage where people need to talk and activities where they think they could actually stop working on a specification. Whether that happens in a formal Dirt Easy working group or within a less formal uh, call, a group type of group called the democracy community groups that are open to everyone that don't have to follow the democracy process strictly. Uh, that's kind of irrelevant and orthogonal. But um, you know, you can look at the list that's on that uh, chart. I expect the the report to be updated later on with a more precise description of all these different projects. I actually had a chat with. Uh, Jeff Jaffe, who is the CEO of DirectVC, who came to me and said, so what do you think? And I was like, well, it's a bit overwhelming, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, I agree with you. And I said, I think this is, you know, in my opinion, this is a sign of lack of maturity, actually, um, because there is so much, and it's very hard to get one topic where everybody can focus on, right? But, you know, I, I, I think there was definitely interest, uh, for sure. And in areas that I would say, you know, uh, lots of interest in interconnecting different, uh, different uh, blockchain networks, if you will. So whether it has to do with the format of the chain or whether it has to do with the protocol, but people recognize that eventually we're going to have these different frameworks out there and networks build on different framework. And sooner or later, we're going to have to interact with those different uh, uh, networks. 
And so there's going to be a need there to have some standard way of connecting those different networks. And so what's expected now is that RTC is going to mow over this, right? And they are going to try to come up with concrete proposals. When it's just community groups, it's kind of a no-brainer for the RTC because it doesn't require the RTC itself to put resources to it. Anybody can go create a community group. So I suspect that all of this will end up with just like, hey, if people are interested, please go ahead and, you know, go create a community group. And they'll advertise this, but they won't do much more than that. In other cases, I suspect they will try to charter working groups to develop, if not standards yet, uh, I would expect they will develop, I mean, they will put together what's called interest groups that are more like discussion forums that are usually a first stepping stone uh, towards creating a working group. They often are used to gather requirements and use cases and then develop a charter for a working group which is then in charge of developing a standard. So that's my summary. I think it was a great event overall and uh, they did a pretty good job of attracting people for sure. That, that was epic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Arnaud. Any, uh, anyone else that was in attendance that wants to share anything? Okay. Let's, um, let's move on then. So the next uh, topic is um, a proposal um, from Conrad from DTCC on a, um, uh, a blockchain explorer. So Conrad, take it away. Yeah. Uh, hey everyone. So um, yeah, I'm actually an internet DTCC and I've been working on this for the past, I guess, month or so. And I'm, I can actually give, um, have a demo prepared for you guys. So um, Varney is on the line, Varney is on the line and I have it hooked up with TeamViewer because I'm developing this on Linux. So uh, GoToMeeting doesn't work, but uh, if you could do screen sharing with you guys, and then um, we could have a live feed, and I could give you guys a demo of the Explorer. Um, but pretty much, uh, what this, the purpose of this Explorer is, um, uh, like pretty much every Bitcoin Explorer like ha has one, like any cryptocurrency um, a blockchain has one, and uh, you can pretty much see the recent blocks. You can see the current state of the blockchain. Um, currently, if you want to see all that information, you have to either dump the entire database, you have to uh, query each um, each search individually, or you have to like run individual command line arguments. So this um, is can a. Can anyone see this, please? I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So pretty much, um, this is a web application written um, in Angular JS. I used a little bit of jQuery um, and some vanilla JavaScript. Uh, HTML5 and CSS and pretty much what it allows you to do is it takes the the 10 most recent um, blocks in the on the blockchain and it queries all the information so you're able to see information such as um, pretty much like the the date like when it was exactly added you could see all the hash information um, you could see all the transaction information and if you want to do this in the past you'd pretty much have to run the command line arguments but this pretty much puts everything in a in a web application that anyone can run so this is not only good for the development community um, but this is also could be used for like demonstrations to potential individuals in the future who'd want to use this and we could actually show them working code like yeah this is this is the current state of the blockchain this is the information that's on it um, like as basic search functionality you could either um, search by block number or you could uh, search by UUID to get the specific transaction number. And um, I tested the compatibility on, uh, it works on Firefox, it works on uh, Chrome. I tested it out in Inter Explorer 11, it works. All versions of Microsoft Edge, it works. Um, uh, I tested it out on Internet Explorer 8 and it doesn't work, but pretty much all of their browsers, um, everything seems to be running fine. Um, I have a few uh, graphs that are written in D3.js, but so far they're kind of just templates. They don't really represent anything. 
Um, I kind of um, here's like a like a concept image that's from a few months back. I kind of based my explorer off of this. Like I kind of used the same color theme, and I tried to um, pretty much set up the graph so that in the future, like once there's more APIs available, then we could just hook up the data into the graphs, and you could have um, information and stuff like that. Um, at the bottom here, I also have the latest transactions. So at the top, um, it shows you the 10 most recent blocks added to the, the blockchain. But at the bottom, it, it shows you all the all the recent transactions. So like, in I had 10 the 10 most recent blocks. I had 16 transactions. You can see. Um, there's also you could expand it and see all the details. Um, so it presents it in a really nice user interface. And on top of that. Um, I developed it so it's mobile friendly. So if you wanted to use this on a phone, you could you could even try doing so. So right now, if I if I really zoom in, um, it, it everything scales like really nicely. So you could use this on a tablet. I'm gonna have to go really slowly showing everything here. Um, and there definitely is a lot of room for expansion, um, like. If you look at like Bitcoin explorers, like there's a lot of really good ones. Then um, there's there's potential to keep adding more information, more graphs. Um, th especially like right now, the network APIs are really limited, so you can only see like the, the amount of peers connected to the network, and um, you can't see like the amount of like um, transactions that an individual has uh, that appear as validated and stuff like that. Um, here I'm gonna here I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. So here it goes in the completely mobile view. And these are just jump sections, so you could jump to a current area. And um, the tables transform dynamically, so it, it's really nice. And you could see all the, the hash information, transaction information, um, pretty much payload, all the information is there. Um, this utilizes the existing uh, gRPC APIs. So um, pretty much um, you need an HTTP server up and running. You need one validating peer at least running, and then pretty much everything else um, everything else seems to work off of that. Um, so uh, long-term support um, tomorrow at DTCC is actually DTCC is actually my last day. So long-term support. Um, we have individuals here. Satish, he's going to uh, take over this, and I'm gonna, I'm going to make sure that like he knows exactly how all the co code works. Um, and long-term, like he's going to put uh, add more and more features to the explore. Um, and uh, this is something that definitely the the community and and anyone can add new features to this. So I guess uh, any feedback on this, or, or like, what do you guys think of this? So, Conrad, this is Chris. I I think it's a really great start. Um, I like where this is going. Um, I think you know. I think it, it would be good. I think Brian actually suggested on the mailing list that. You know, we maybe could you know, have some things that we, that IBM did with its uh, blockchain explorer that open sourced in the IBM blockchain. You're breaking up, Chris. Can you hear me? There's some static on the line, I think. Um, if you're a phone caller, if you wouldn't mind just going on mute, uh, so I don't need to mute all the lines. Um, but I, I think this is I think this is a good start. I think you know the one concern I have is is going forward. And I'd like to see others uh, collaborate and contribute on this. Um, so maybe Brian's idea is a good one. But the challenge that we have there is that I think that and Ian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the Explorer and IBM blockchain thing was also developed by an intern, and I don't know that we still have that intern. Here, so. I'm breaking up. It's kind of hard to hear. Yeah, Chris, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone, and then I'll take you off mute. One sec. All right, there okay. you go. So, um, as I was saying, I think the challenge that we have, so Brian had suggested, why don't we merge, or, you know, sort of from a project perspective, merge it with, um, you know, IBM's uh, contribution. Um, and... Um, uh, we, we haven't actually contributed. I've been pushing to get that done. The challenge, of course, is getting somebody to to work on it and support it. Um, the, the the version of an explorer that 
IBM had written, I think was also written by an intern, and I don't know that that individual is still um, uh, with IBM, but... Um, the one that IBM um, is looking to contribute is actually uh, written by the Bluemix team, and it's still um, under active de development. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so it's it's a pretty uh, full fledged. Uh, it, I would say that one's almost more than an explorer because it has some functions such as being able to, for example, uh, submit a chain code. Uh, so I almost wonder if these are two separate projects. Like um, uh, this one from Conrad is a, a bit like of a, a light explorer. You know, some something you can use to view what's going on on the blockchain and use it on your phone and tablet, um, which I think is very useful. And then the, the one that IBM is looking to donate uh, may be, you know, a bit of a kind of heavier, um, you know, almost turning it into like a web SDK or something. And I don't think the, the IBM Bluemix, it isn't open source at the moment, and I don't think it will be open sourced. Um, I don't know who has that information, but um, it was entire... <laughs> I, I think you scared them into open sourcing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, nevertheless, like, an explorer is definitely needed for for a project like this. Yeah, um, this is very cool. So I'm actually like uh, my last day is tomorrow, so I'm pretty much ready to to push the code um, like today or tomorrow. And I was just wondering like. Um, I mean, if if everyone's okay with me pushing the code to the master repository, like um, I could, um, there are some like right now I have it pretty much. It's in the uh, five fabric uh, peer directory, so it's kind of just um, randomly in a directory. I was wondering like if there's any like specific area where I should put this code, or should I create a new new like section, or, or like what do you guys think? You well, just I mentioned that this Brian. is your last day. How do you, uh, which technology is it written, and how do you uh, propose to work on continuing on that? Um, like I said, uh, this is developed uh, using Angular JS, a um, little bit of jQuery, JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and uh, pretty much to connect to the to the blockchain, it uses the existing gRPC APIs. So you just need uh, a validating peer running one HTTP server to handle the request. And um, pretty much, you open this file in a browser, and you're good to go. So that's that's how it works. Um, later on, like more advanced features can be developed. To like, like right now, there's a there's a REST endpoint setting that's just in the script file. So if you want to redirect the REST endpoint to some other HTTP server, you have to like go and manually change that. But later on, there could be like configuration files, and you could have like uh, there's more advanced features that could definitely be added to this. But for the moment being, like I think it's it's a really good start. And, and I believe you said someone do from... Do you contributing to it after you push? Uh, can you say that again? Do you, do you plan contributing to the project after you pushed it? Um, at DTCC, there's going to be individuals who work here full-time that will be taking over this. I'm already like teaching them uh, exactly going through the code, making sure that they know like how it all works. Um, so uh, there's Satish. Uh, he's not on the call right now, but he's going to be taking over a uh, uh, long time, long term support of this, and he's going to be adding new features in the future. You know, I'm I'm going back to college in in about a month, uh, so I want to be kind of busy. But who knows? If I have time, I might uh, contri contribute some stuff. But uh, at DTCC, there will be full time employees that will take over this, and they'll be contributing code long term. So that's not a worry. Uh, this is Brian. I think. Um, when we when we take a new project in, we're partly evaluating um, what that project does, but we're also partly evaluating um, the team of people who will be coming around it and continuing the work, right? To at the very least support what's been built, but hopefully evolve it further. And with <clears throat> with this news that IBM may um, open source and contribute their their uh, explorer as well, and we may have a have two of them, and maybe we merge them, maybe they are, they remain separate. There's a great opportunity here, I think, to create a, um, a project that kind of sits logically separate from Fabric. Um, uh, it talks to Fabric, but maybe it also talks to Bautiz Lake or to other, uh, other chains in the future. Um, 
but uh, I think what's important in a proposal like this is to reflect who those contributors are going forward um, and um, make sure that they are committed to building a project the, the Hyperledger way. Um, uh, and uh, I think we can, um, you know, get started on this. I'm excited about it, but I'd love to see kind of the, the people at the TCC who will be taking this on after you um, and the, uh, the people at IBM who know uh, that code base well kind of get together and maybe think about a joint proposal, um, putting collectively their names on it and talking about, you know, if it makes sense to work together and how they might work together and that sort of thing. Um, what, what do other people think? Yeah, yeah, so I want to add a comment. This is Murali from DTCC. So, so we are we are committed to this, right? So we have also we also taken up the Java chain code, and uh, you know if everybody is in agreement on the Hyperledger Explorer, we can work closely with IBM, and and uh, but in general, DTCC, if we get the approval, you know we are committed to the Hyperledger Explorer. Just to add to that, uh, this is Vani from DTCC as well. Um, you know, we are already working closely with IBM on the Java chain code. The, the individual that was mentioned, uh, um, Conrad has been working with Shia on, uh, on this, and so is Satish um, on the Java chain code aspect. So yeah, we definitely can continue the collaboration and uh, you know see where uh, where it goes from here. Whether it they exist as two separate uh, projects or just merge them in future. <clears throat> so I, I think, you know, I think from certainly from an IBM perspective, I think we'd be more than happy to figure out how we collaborate around, um, you know, the the concept of um, an explorer. Um, uh, I have to do a little digging because again, this is sort of, you know, as Sheehan noted, this is actually something that's been developed by the Bluemix team, not the IBM uh, blockchain team. There's IBM's a big place, <laughs> and uh, and so I'd have to figure out, um, you know, who that group is, and and uh, you know how interested they are in open sourcing it and so forth. There's an awful lot of sort of Bluemix specific stuff that we'd have to tease out and so forth, um, uh, and then of course that means you have to. Be able to sort of, you know, get a team uh, open to the idea of working out in open source. Um, I'm I'm happy to go help to, to help drive that, and and I'd be more than happy to help, uh, you know, collaborate on uh, with DTC and anyone else who's interested in thinking about starting a you know sort of explore project where we could, um, you know, where we could take in. Uh, you know, various pieces of work and eventually come out with something that we can all leverage that potentially even, you know, has, has been suggested in the Slack of having the ability to talk to either Sawtooth or Fabric or whatever, I think would be awesome. Um, so I think, okay. Brian, uh, I think your idea is, is spot on. <clears throat> then then uh, um, let's not uh, wait on uh, what sounds like it's a pro might be a process that IBM is figuring out. How uh, how does it forward with the Linux code? It sounds like the intent is there, which is great. But why don't we launch um, a Hyperledger Explorer project? Um, uh, set up a mailing list for it. Set up a repository for it, um, and uh, get the uh, the DTCC developers uh, set up with commit privileges. Um, see if there's anyone else who um, expresses a strong interest in being a part of the project. Um, and uh, get get going on this, and IBM can then um, bring their code to this project or propose a separate project if they feel it should be different. But um, um, one project can have two different arms to it, like like this. Um, but let's not hold up Conrad's great code and and this project, because um, I think this is a valuable way to uh, get even more developers involved with uh, with Fabric and with Autos Lake. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, this code's pretty much, it's already ready to go. Um, with, with working with the Bluemix team would probably take some time before um, getting our, the Hyperledger infrastructure like hooked up and everything. But pretty much um, this, is, this code's good to go. And 
um, people can start using it, I guess, tomorrow for just like demo purposes and 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 like exploring the blockchain and stuff like that. So. So I, I I think I think Brian I, I think I like your idea. Um, uh, I think and it was suggested in the chat and I, I you know Dan and I don't know um, uh, what others uh, think about this, but um, I wonder if we start a sort of explorer project and then have the first repository be Fabric Explorer, um, and if. You know, if, if if that can consolidate down into being more generally valuable, you know, just like we did with the chain tool, if that can become more generally useful, we can think about renaming it if we have to. But um, just I don't, so I think, why don't we just start it? Why don't we just start it as Hyperledger Dash Explorer, um, and uh, you know, start it with the uh, the premise that the team is free to explore connecting to Sotus Lake and other blockchain tech. Um, they don't have to, but uh, um, you know, I don't think we have to be, you know, early binding on this. I think we can be late binding. Um, <laughs> uh, and and it's really simple. It's the uh, it's the uh, Hyperledger Explorer uh, thing. I, I'm I'm good with that. I just I was trying to be sensitive to. Um, okay, I didn't mean to steamroll you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. I, I, anybody disagree? Well, I, I think uh, as long as it is only connectable with the fabric, it would be more appropriate to be, keep it there. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much completely separate from the fabric. Um, like I said, uh, the only it interacts with the existing uh, code through just a one HTTP server. So this could completely be stripped out and be in its own uh, directory. Well, with connectable, I meant it is using really the concepts of fabric, right? So it's using using the concepts of chain code. It's uh, it is using the UUID. If I just look at the picture, everything that I see is very fabric specific. Yeah. Um, so either no. we either we really really start thinking about making it more generic, or I think it would be more appropriate to keep it with fabric. So, so Dan, let me ask you: Would would you think Intel would be willing to sort of help Sawtooth Lakeify this? Yeah, that's that's something we could think about. I just put the uh, the web API uh, for Sawtooth into the into the chat. So there's there's endpoints, there's REST endpoints that I think that a front end like this should probably be able to consume um, without too much trouble. I just don't know without Looking at the the project, uh, how tightly it is to how tightly bound it is to assumptions about the the URIs. Um, but I think that, that those those assumptions could be addressed, and you know there could be a little bootstrap thing that figured out. Oh, I'm talking to Sawtooth Lake, and therefore I use these, um, uh, you know, these tiles versus, you know, if I'm talking to Fabric, I use it slightly different set of tiles, but some of the stuff is basically the same. Yeah, it's certainly possible. It, it's hard to, to say without looking at it in more detail. We also have an explorer that um, uh, that we're anticipating having in in a state that can be released within the next couple of weeks here too. So that might fold into the the mix, but I'm I'm not quite sure how because you know we're going to have probably it sounds like three or four different explorer ish projects that could all be mixed or evolved separately. Okay, I didn't want to, uh, yeah, I didn't realize you guys had one in the, in the works as well. Well, this is good because it teaches them all out. Um, <laughs> I, I guess, and, and again, we're sort of running up against the, the clock here, um, and uh, maybe the thing to do is take a step back. Uh, let's not make a decision just yet, although I, I'd be happy to accept this project uh, you know, given that DTCC is willing to take it forward, I think the naming is is the the real challenge, and I I think we need to collectively and, and you know Brian to your point on on another thread about 
you know, how do we get these projects going forward? I do think we probably need to have a little bit of thought given, and maybe we can do that next week on how do we, how do we, how do we handle when we have multiples of the same thing? What's, what's our criteria for accepting them and so forth? I think um, maybe we need to, to do a little bit of thinking, but, you know, Conrad, I think this is in currently in your own personal repository. Um, if I mean, I, I mean, one thing we could, we, of course, we can always fork it. But um, you know, if and since your your last day is tomorrow, I just don't want to put us in a situation where we can't reach you. If we need to. Um, it's I going it's, to. I think it's thing. Okay, good. Um, it's, I'm going to be pushing the code to uh, Satish. He's he's full time at DTCC, and then uh, from that repository, like I'm going to push it to the master on uh, Hyperledger, so that um, he's going to be able to manage all the existing code in the future. So he's going to have full control over it. Okay. And I was going to say, as long as uh, you know, some the author states that it's, uh, or the IP owner states that it's under Apache 2.0, we can accept it later. Um, uh, even after the authors move on, um, but either way, it sounds like we're going to get it in at some point and move forward. So that's great. Well, Conrad, I do, I do want to thank you. It's a great piece of work, and uh, and it's certainly getting the, the sort of I, I love the collaborative thinking that is going in the office. So that's 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 really good. Um, but I think you have to sort of move on. I think. What I'd like to do is I'd like to ask, ask the work group lead, since we are out of time, basically to send your um, status to the mailing list so that we all get a sense of where where things stand. Although I know it's been a slow couple of weeks, um, but we haven't uh, we haven't met for for a few weeks, and so um, I think it'd be great to get a, an email update from each of the the work group leads. Um, I'll, I'll send a note to that effect as well, just to make sure I'm not sure that everybody's on. Um, with that, is there any other um, any other business for today? Um, just a quick question. Uh, so when I push the code, should I just should I keep it in Fabric or should I just create a separate one? I. Um, so I think that uh, ultimately what we'll probably want to do is work with, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember the name. It was a Satish you said was taking over? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we'll, we'll work with Satish on actually getting it um, uh, merged in. I mean, we could, I guess we could merge it into the fabric, but um, I, I think that, that creates a different set of problems. Um, I, th I think it would be best if you pushed it to Satish we make sure that all the licensing and stuff from DTCC is is covered uh, appropriately, and then we can um, uh, we can bring it in. And I pr I think that the direction we seem to be heading in was to create a separate repository for this to 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 evolve. Okay. But I think we'll have Satish handle that uh, end of it. Okay. Sounds least. good. <clears throat> Any other um, any other business? If not, I think uh, I'd like to thank everybody and um, great call. And we'll talk to you all next week. And thanks again to Dan and Sheehan for helping out with uh, the uh, the Cybos demo uh, brainstorming. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris.